Hi, I'm Jonathan Bird. You're listening to my podcast. You can read this podcast at my Substack account, jonathanbird.substack.com. Years before I considered studying physics, I met Professor Peter Salson, and the afternoon we met, I was in town to play a concert in Syracuse, New York. The Salsons helped make the concert possible by providing accommodations at their house for the night. So I shook Peter's hand at the door. I asked, what do you do? He said, I'm a physicist. It's rare to meet someone so excited about their work that the mention of it makes them grin with gratitude. If they have any social awareness, they have learned not to talk about it too much. I am one of those people. (laughs) We're like vampires. You must invite us in. If you do, be prepared. You may become one of us. Maybe that is what happened to me. I asked Peter, what are you working on? He took me into the kitchen and over coffee, he patiently tested how much I knew how much I wanted to know, always graciously offering to wrap up the conversation. I could have talked about it for a week, and the years between we probably have. Now, while I didn't learn much about physics in Peter's kitchen, I learned what it was like to be a physicist. Peter Salson, a Harvard and Princeton alum, a professor and researcher at Syracuse University, had worked on a single experiment for much of his career, an experiment that had cost over a billion dollars, and it had never shown results. Despite that, he was still excited about it. The result of the experiment, conducted by a team of a thousand world-renowned physicists, postdocs, undergrads, and engineers, is now well known. But years ago, in the Salson's kitchen, it was anyone's guess. I have since come to understand why Peter was not dissuaded and was perhaps even encouraged by the conspicuous lack of an outcome. Now, Peter is now retired. This summer, I called him up and interviewed him for a class assignment. When I asked him why he chose such difficult research, he said, You can fail at anything. Are you working on something for which failure will produce an interesting result. A failure to find what they were looking for could have been one of the most intriguing results in the history of physics. In the 1800s, experimental physicists were able to show that light was a wave. And this was exciting because even the most ancient nerds knew how waves worked. Sound waves travel through the air. Water waves travel across the surface of the ocean. Victorian-era physicists hypothesized that light waves must also have a medium, and they called it the luminiferous ether, because (laughs) back in the steampunk days, they could really name things. Around this time, a physicist named Albert Michelson became known for measuring the speed of light with unprecedented accuracy and designing clever optical instruments. Michelson realized that he could detect the ether, this hypothesized medium that filled the universe, if he could precisely measure a difference in the speed of light from two perpendicular directions at once. So if you've ever swum in a current, you know how much of a difference the direction you choose can make. Uh, So based on this simple physical observation, Michelson hypothesized that light should appear to be moving at different speeds depending on whether it was swimming with, against, or across the ether. The tool Michelson designed to make this measurement was so ingenious, it is still used in physics labs today. This was over 120 years ago. So in fact, it's called a Michelson interferometer. And true to its name, it measures interference, the way that waves interact with each other. So a modern example of wave interference is noise-canceling headphones. I don't know if you know this, but they, they work not by turning down the noise, but by recording the noise and playing it back flipped. 
So the new sound wave peaks when the original dips, and it dips when the original peaks. The waves add together in your headphones, but instead of making it twice as loud, they cancel each other. The waves interfere. So the Michelson interferometer works on a similar principle. A single beam of light is split and sent down two perpendicular paths of equal length. Mirrors send the light back, and the two beams join each other again. If the paths are the same length, the beam at the end will look like the original. If the paths are different lengths, or if light takes a different amount of time to travel one of the paths, one beam will destructively interfere with the other. When Michelson first tested the interferometer, horses and pedestrians walking by his lab jostled the instrument enough to overwhelm the tiny result he was looking for. Rather than being frustrating, this was a good indication of the device's sensitivity. Michelson enlisted the help of another renowned experimentalist, Edward Morley. They improved the interferometer, installing it on a sandstone slab that floated on a pool of mercury to isolate it from tiny vibrations. Finally, the instrument was accurate enough to measure the hypothesized movement of the ether. They could turn the interferometer on the pool of mercury, facing one beam in the direction of the Earth's travel and the other perpendicular. They could try it in different seasons as the Earth changed its angle of movement through space around its orbit. As Michelson and Morley turned it, the idea was that one beam of light swam against the ether's current and the other swam across. But no matter what they tried, they could not detect the ether the speed of light seemed to be exactly the same in all directions. They considered the experiment, which would produce one of the most revolutionary results in modern science, a failure. And the news quickly made its way through the physics community. A wave that traveled through nothing was so counterintuitive that physicists of the time could not imagine a theory without the ether. They even suggested that the ether wind shortened one path of the interferometer just enough to cancel out the difference in speed. And that sounds crazy. But to be fair, the truth is equally bizarre. Henrik Lorentz worked out uh, equations for this length contraction that would become important for reasons he couldn't guess. Uh, Henri Poincaré refined this into a robust theory of relativity that included all the funky things that Einstein would say about time and distance, but all this correct work was done with an incorrect understanding. Now, we all know who Albert Einstein is now, but what you may not know is that Einstein took all this work that others had done to defend the ether hypothesis and flipped it on its head. If the ether existed, it would be the one frame of reference by which all other distances and times could be measured. What if there was no special frame of reference in the universe? What if the speed of light was always the same, no matter how the observer was moving? This was Einstein's insight in the special theory of relativity in 1905, and it leads to all these weird paradoxes with time and distance that seem to be true. So by 1915, Einstein had produced the general theory of relativity, this astonishingly accurate theory of how space, time, matter, and energy work together to create and move the universe. No ether required. In 1919, Arthur Eddington observed as the sun's gravity bent the light of a distant star, just as the theory predicted, and overnight, Einstein became the wild-haired icon of genius that we know today. Michelson and others never quite gave up on the idea of the ether. His inventions and research won him a Nobel Prize, but he considered his most famous experiment a failure. As I sat in the kitchen with Peter, he carefully and patiently explained his research. He said, gravity can also make waves. They're tiny, but we think that when very energetic things happen in the universe, like black holes colliding, we might be able to detect that. 
What is waving? I asked. Space-time. Space itself is compressing and expanding? Yes, maybe. We think? And you're trying to take a picture of these waves. He says, well, it's more like a sound than an image. The signal we're looking for is in a range you can hear if you could convert it into acoustic vibrations. The fact that I was getting ready to send acoustic vibrations across a concert hall to this man (laughs) was not lost on me. I wondered how country music compared to the music of colliding black holes. In the intervening years, I've learned a little about gravitational waves and the machine they built to find them. Relativity predicts them, but even Einstein was unsure of their existence. In the 1960s, a few physicists began to wonder if there might be some new technology that was sensitive enough to detect them. Devices were built, they failed. In the mid-1970s, radio astronomers Russell Hulse and uh, Joe Taylor observed a pair of stars in a binary system that spiraled closer as they orbited, meaning they were losing energy, and that energy had to go somewhere. Um, And when I talked about this with Peter, he said the the energy, they calculated the, the energy loss precisely matched the prediction that Einstein's theory made. So this was a pretty strong case for an indirect detection of gravitational waves. Several researchers, among them future Nobel Prize winner uh, Rainer Weiss, realized there might already be an instrument that could detect gravitational waves, an instrument that was in almost every physics lab in the world. And over the next few decades, they built prototypes and iterations ever more sensitive. And in 1981, Peter Salson got involved in the most promising build to date. It was called LIGO. In September 2015, years after I sat at Peter's kitchen table, the LIGO collaboration made the first ever verified detection of gravitational waves. When I heard the news, I called Peter to congratulate him. He seemed pleased, but no more excited about the project than when I met him, long before anyone knew if LIGO would show results. Maybe like anyone who loves to solve problems, he was thinking about the next mystery. Peter had either never described the engineering aspect of the experiment, or I didn't know enough at the time to visualize it. I looked around and I found a newsreel online, and they showed the LIGO facility and explained briefly how it worked. There are two long perpendicular tunnels. They split a beam of light and send it down both tunnels. Mirrors bounce the light back and the two beams join again. LIGO is an acronym for the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. It is a Michelson interferometer. Seances were popular in those heady Victorian years. If I could reach Albert Michelson beyond the veil, I would tell him all the amazing work his ideas and innovations have produced. I would tell him what Peter told me. You can fail at anything. Are you working on something for which failure will produce an interesting result? Thanks for listening again. You can read this podcast at jonathanbird.substack.com. Paid subscribers help me pay the bills. I appreciate it. Peter wanted to add this note that it might be interesting to say why Michelson considered this null result a failure instead of a discovery. So Michelson worried that the ether wind might be impossible to observe in a laboratory on Earth, perhaps because the the building's roof or even the atmosphere above the lab somehow entrained the light. Um, In later years, he tried the experiment on a mountaintop. I think it was Mount Wilson. If this kind of thing was the problem, then he hadn't discovered anything but a systematic error in his measurement, and he didn't realize how important 
um, this discovery was. Uh, special thanks to C. Ellen Honeycutt and Catherine Dow, who helped me to uh, edit this, and also to Peter Salson, who gave me some great notes on this. If you enjoyed it, please share it. The post on Substack is, Substack is public. It's free to read, uh, and you can subscribe. That's free as well. And if you'd like to read my entire interview with Peter Salson, please consider becoming a paid subscriber to my Substack. I'm your fan, Jonathan Bird.